All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to OTF Connect session with Garfield Ginny Newman, Inspiring Awe and Wonder, uh, talking all about student engagement in uh, in the classroom. So we're we're very happy to have Garfield. He's done a number of sessions for OTF Connects, um, and uh, he always does a wonderful job and always gets you gets you thinking and, and uh, get, you know leaves you lots to ponder as we go through. He uh, he's a lecturer at um, at U of T and also works with the Critical Thinking Consortium and has got a wealth of experience to share. So uh, I once again am looking forward to hearing from Garfield tonight. So thanks, Garfield, for joining us. And we'll get to you in a second. One of the things that we love about OTF Connects is it, it brings people together from all across the province. And, and just a few minutes ago, everybody who was online here um, sort of grabbed a, grabbed a picture and, and showed uh, all of us where they all are. So we've got people from, from all over the province, which is just wonderful. And I know uh, Syria from OTF loves to see this. And she would thank each of you personally if she could. She's not here this evening, but uh, she does pass on her, her, uh, her thanks and uh, best wishes to everybody. All right. So, without any further ado, I'm going to pop ahead to the next slide. And Garfield, I will step out of the way and let you take control. And whenever you need me to do anything for you, you just let me know, and I'll just jump in. Okay? Great. Thanks, Colin. And uh, the first thing I'll ask you to do, Colin, is to assure me that you can hear me. Okay? Yep, I can certainly hear you. No problem. Great. Oh, great. Okay. Well. Um, Welcome everyone, and, and, and as Colin said, it's great to see such a nice wide representation. And uh, I, I want to tell you up front, I'm I'm really excited about tonight in part because uh, this is a session for me that that's some new, a lot a lot of new thinking on my part about some issues, and and I'm hoping that to push some buttons and be provocative and and get us thinking about issues. Uh, I have a slide coming up that. Uh, is really just to set the context for why I want to do this session, what I'm hoping to address. Anyway, we'll get started. I just uh, uh, just thought I'd tell you, by the way, I'm, I'm in Caledon East, so I'm in the center of, of I just north of Toronto, kind of the center of that map to some degree. And the image you have before you is the recent ice storm. And uh, I posted something on Instagram that I called beautiful destruction because once again, I've lost several trees on our property. It's stunning to look at as the sun shines through, but boy, I've got to get the chainsaw going this weekend. So anyway, we will get into to the session, uh, Inspiring Awe and Wonder. Um, and I started as I put it together to, to use this term, inspired learning. And hopefully that will make sense as we move along. And so, so why the topic tonight? Um, these are four things that kind of were driving me that I was thinking about. And sorry, I'm just going to pause there and see if we may have a, a question or two. Uh, let me just pause and see. Yeah, we now have two Christines. I'm not sure what's happening. She might be having some technical issues. Christine, did you, did you have a question, or was that just something else that was going on? Probably just go ahead, Garfield. If she has right. a question, maybe she can. Oh, you there? She's having issues. Oh, OK. OK, so we'll keep an eye on us. So let me uh, set up the, the broad context text of the, the reasons I wanted to, to talk a bit about this tonight. Uh, one is to address what I think are some misunderstandings I encounter sometimes around inquiry, um, especially, as you can see here, this notion that uh, for it to truly be inquiry, students have to initiate um, the question. And, and, and well, as we get into this, I'll, I'll explore why I find that a bit problematic. Um, that students uh, definitely want to be investigators in an active way, um, but we, we have a curriculum, um, and inquiry does not necessarily mean that someone that I have to be the instigator, but we'll explore that. I also have a concern which I'll less directly get at, so I want to comment on it for, for a moment now, and, and I'll pause after this one. I have a concern that sometimes we can devalue teacher expertise in that, and this is why I've of the session, inspiring on wonder in students, that I, I sometimes get concerned when the perception of inquiry is it's always driven by student interest. Because I think there are a lot of uh, worlds to explore that children know nothing about, that they, that they don't know about an author, an artist, uh, an event. And when they come to school, one of the opportunities I think we have is to inspire them with tales and inspire them with poets and artists that, that they otherwise might know nothing about. And, and I think that draws on, on our expertise as, as educators 
and how we can tap into a world that the kids may not be familiar with and excite them. So that's part of it. I want to value that kind of expertise we have to open doors for kids. I want to just pause on that one and see if there's any, you know, you can either give me a thumbs down, a thumbs up, an applause, a comment in the chat. Um, but I, I'd love just to get a sense of, of your reaction when I say that, that sometimes inquiry it needs to be inspired by teachers so that we open doors uh, for kids that they otherwise may not have opened. So let me just see some thoughts. Jeez, I thought saw Collins first. I thought that was in response to my question, uh, but I think it's a technical. I'm not sure why that might be. But anyway, let, let's hear some other thoughts as well. Okay, so I'm seeing lots of agreement. I'm glad, uh, and I want to get more concrete with that, but I want to see where we stand. My other uh, concern, and, and, and you'll see these are concerns that have come up for me as I work with, with um, teachers across the province and internationally. My hope is that, that what I'm calling tonight inspired learning becomes routine. So I really like Genius Hour, where I've seen them in schools. I think they're a really neat idea. And I really like passion projects. On the other hand, I, I want to find a way that passion is routine. It's, it's rather than it being an add-on, a, a once-a-week thing, my ideal would be when we find the passion and learning that, that, that it becomes routine. So I think they're a great starting point. I love the spirit behind passion projects and genius hours. Um, but as I said, yeah, I, I want to see it embedded. That it's just that inspiring kids with excitement is a daily thing as opposed to the project or when they get to do the project. I think it needs to be every day. And we'll, we'll try to um, dig into that a little bit. And this, this is an important point for me to talk to for a moment, my fourth one. I think, you know, how do we ignite a passion for lifelong learning in students? And, and when I say that, notice my note in this is that tonight's talk is about the passion, not the tools. And what do I mean by that? Uh, a lot of times when I'm on talking with you, you know, it'll be around intellectual tools for critical thinking and so on. But tonight I want it to just focus on how do we just inspire that wide-eyed, on wondering kids. It's another session to talk about, and then how do we support your deep thinking? How do we teach your deep understanding? That's another topic. But tonight I want to just focus on just getting kids fascinated in the world they live and wanting to know and wanting to explore. How do we just capture that passion. And so my focus tonight is more around that, that way that we hook kids than it is the, the way we teach for deep thinking, which relates, but we don't have time for all of that. So here are two things, and this is part of my um, um, inspiration for thinking about some of these things lately. I encountered these two comments, and, and um, oh, Deb, you're, you're going to be a, a great one tonight to have on. Thanks for that comment, modeling the curiosity. That's uh, absolutely. Uh, and by the way, let me just pick up on what you're saying there. I, I, I saw this tweet uh, maybe two months ago, six weeks ago, and it said, a teacher's job is to inspire students and then get out of their way. And I'll be quite frank, uh, that raises concerns for me, that, that our job is to inspire kids and then get out of the way and just let them go. Um, I'm not sure I can justify my salary, first of all, but more importantly, I don't know that we will get very far, very deep by inspiring kids and getting out of the way. So it, it worries me a little bit. The flip side, let me just give you the second one. I was in watching one of my students practice teaching, and very good student, and he had doing a grade 10 lesson on the end of World War II. Uh, very nicely prepared PowerPoint, well researched, uh, but it was a very transmissive lesson. The students were passive um, as, as they received. And, and when I spoke to the student after, I said, you know, I was surprised at how little invitation there was for students to turn and talk to each other, to solve a problem, to deal with an issue. That was a very transmissive lesson. And he said to me, well, my associate teacher has told me several times during my practice teaching block, and this is the quote, sometimes you just have to teach content. You can't do critical thinking in every lesson. And I found myself wondering with that one, okay, is that true? Is it, is it true you just sometimes you just have to teach content? 
and that you can't have critical thinking in every lesson. So I wanted you to respond to either or both of those. One kind of saying, you know, our job is to excite kids and then let them go and away they go and learn. And the other saying, well, sometimes you just have to push out the content at them and they need to sit and receive content. I want to just pause and get your reaction to one or both of those statements. I think they're kind of coming at opposite ends. One is, um, you know, sometimes there is very much teacher control, and the other suggesting no teachers need to get out of the way. So your thoughts on that. And again, feel free. I'm going to turn off my mic for just a few minutes. Please feel free to jump on the mic and offer a thought or uh, type in your thought. But I'd love to get your response. Great, thanks. Uh, I just uh, want to pick up on a couple of the comments. Um, I really like this notion of co-learning, uh, and I want to put a focus. I want to be clear when I when I'm uh, saying this. My job, I, I would argue, a teacher's job is uh, not to teach answers to kids, but to teach them the intellectual tools they need to arrive at sound answers. And, and so many of you have talked about guiding, and I would agree that um, ensuring they have enough context and background knowledge to engage in the thinking, that we give them strategies that organize or help them make sense, that they have criteria to help them think, those are all the tools that we're not going to focus on so much tonight, but certainly I think kids are more engaged and inspired with awe and wonder when they're also successful in their inquiry. And, and you know, if they're not, I think it's going to be really difficult. Uh, Catherine knows it depends on, on the grade that you're teaching, and um, it's, you know, I think you're absolutely right. When I've asked this question to recently to some primary teachers, they would say to me, uh, in a primary grade, you'd never get away with just teaching content one day. You would just lose them. And it is an interesting uh, reaction I've gotten that the higher we go in the grades, the more we seem willing to have kids sit passively and receive information, because primary teachers are pretty consistent. You can do that in a primary class. Um, let me just uh, pick up on, because I want to be uh, somewhat concrete, uh, when some of you were talking about that we can do both, uh, thinking and content. And this is the point that I, I made to my students, is that teaching, engaging kids in thinking when teaching content should not be a choice I have to make it to the content or thinking. And, and just to, to follow up, the student I was talking about had been encouraged to highlight he would put, for example, four points on each slide in point form, uh, and he would highlight in yellow the one that was the important point, and students were told, make sure you copy the yellow one down, that's the important point. And that just struck me as a missed opportunity uh, to engage kids in thinking, and that should be their job. Here are four facts, they're all true, they're just not all important to the issue we've been dealing with. Which three are you going to copy down? Uh, we have critical thinking. You know, here's a slide, but I didn't put a title on it. Take a look at the facts, connect them in some way, and come up with a, an informative and engaging title. Talk to a partner. You know, we have critical thinking. So, you know, I think that every day in my class we have an opportunity to engage kids in critical thinking. And this notion that sometimes you just teach content, I think that really gets in the way of all in wonder because it means kids become compliant um, and they and passive, and, and I think that's kind of the uh, the antithesis of what we're here to talk about tonight. So I wanted to start this off um, and, and just get us thinking about how we get in, into that piece. And I said I want to touch on, you know, clarifications around inquiry. Uh, this came up the other day. I was, I was doing some work in a school, uh, and someone said to me, well, haven't you set the inquiry by, by having that framing question? I had set up a a, a, an overarching uh, provocation and some lines of inquiry to explore. And and someone you know was concerned that, well, shouldn't kids be generating those, uh, doesn't inquiry have to start with the students? And I, I did say to the teacher, well, it was a grade eight teacher, uh, and, and I'd love to get see your thoughts on this. Um, grade eight history teacher, 
I said, how many of your students, 13 years old, asked what would you like to study in history are going to put down confederation? Uh, I haven't met that many kids uh, who will say, yes, I can't wait to do confederation. Um, I mean, I'm a, I have a graduate degree in history, and I don't even like confederation that much. So, But it's the curriculum, and, and someone made the point earlier. Uh, you know, we have a legal obligation to address certain things that are in the curriculum. So, you know, we do need to find this balance. But I want to just take a look. I'm going to pause, turn my mic off. And I've pulled two quotes uh, on the, the top left and bottom right. Um, and, and they're both from the ministry's, um, oh, I don't know, the, the sheet, the briefing sheets they create. Someone help me with the term. Um, anyway, ministry document they sent out on inquiry. Uh, what's it called? Yes, it's a monograph. Thank you. Uh, they have another name for it. But anyway, I pulled those two from there. I pulled one from Wikipedia. This top touches on um, on inquiry. And the Galileo Project is based in the University of Calgary. It's an inquiry-based uh, approach. So I want you to take a moment and read through and see if you can find, and if you could jot down after you take a minute, read through, is there anything that, that, that links them together, any concept emerging for you? that suggests well, what, what's at the, at the core of inquiry learning. Uh, what would you say links these together? Says, this is really essential. This is at the core of inquiry learning. And then I'll come back in, in a couple of minutes and just see how we tie these together. Thanks for those comments, and I know there's a few more coming. Um, and and I, I like the way you've been teasing out the, the links, the building on curiosity, um, the, the kind of uh, collaborative nature of inquiry, um, knowledge building by exploring and resolving doubt. Um, these are, are important pieces. And, and notice none of them presume that it has to start from student interest nor has to start from student question, that teachers might be the initiator or the provocateur. Um, to initiate that inquiry, to raise the questions, and that to me is part of our job, is to help kids, you know, to, to plant that wonderment in a subject that a student may not uh, have, have wondered about. But, but because of school, because of good teachers, they begin to wonder. Um, and, and so I wanted you to note, by the way, take a look at um, the Galileo Project, and, and I really like in their second line, they talk about inquiry as a stance. And I think this is an important distinction. I mean, we do talk about inquiry-based learning or IBL, but I, I would uh, I think it may be more powerful for us to, to think about inquiry as a methodology, or as they say, a stance. That it, and, and that way it pervades everything, whereas inquiry-based learning kind of sets it up as an approach, uh, somehow distinct from other approaches. Yet if we see it as a stance, and, and we use it many of the ways that you've been talking about, it can be every day, and it can be infused in a variety of approaches. It doesn't matter if I'm, you know, I might be doing problem-based learning or project-based learning in which I'm creating versus solving a problem, right? I may be using case studies and, excuse me, a case-based learning or, you know, as with the kindergarten program, a discovery-based. Even properly understood direct instruction can have, can have elements of inquiry. That inquiry is a stance or methodology that really underpins any good teaching, where it, it's based around kids exploring questions, uh, generating more questions, and so on. So, you know, I think it's it's uh, helpful for us tonight as we look at inquiry as a route to inspire awe and wonder, that we see it as something that can be infused regardless of the approach a, a teacher, a school, or a district has adopted. And I want us to think about this, and, and, and for those of you, and, and I'm not meaning to promote my book, but just 
you know, the, the book we have on creating thinking classrooms, in chapter um, 13, uh, we talk about revolution or renovation. So I just want to pause for a moment. Uh, interesting question, Jeremy. Does inquiry involve a critical questioning or the other way around? Uh, let me try to answer it this way and, and see if this makes sense. We will sometimes use the term critical inquiry, although to some degree adding critical to the front of inquiry is, is redundant. Uh, we like to say it's helpfully redundant. Uh, and what we mean by that is there's a difference between research and inquiry. Um, you know, it's sometimes helpful to think about research and, you know, in fact, we break down to research. In other words, to go locate what others have written about it. So when kids do a research project, I'm going to go find out what's been written about this topic, and I'm going to create a report and tell you what I found. But for no apparent reason, not to reach a conclusion or not to solve a problem. But we, when we hold an inquiry, it's to arrive at a truth, to resolve an issue. So inquiry, by its definition, uh, has a critical component that, that we and, and is used in a purposeful way. So critical inquiry is a helpful or redundant way to say inquiry is not simply the assembling of information. Uh, it, it is, in fact, the, uh, the use of the information to construct knowledge to help us reach a sound conclusion. So I hope that makes sense, that, that uh, inquiry should have, always, always must have, to be true inquiry, a critical component. And I wanted just to, to, to jump back to this the slide that I have here. To have you think about this, and I, I watch, you know, track, you know, lots of people on, on Twitter and read comments, and I realized uh, one of the distinctions um, in, in the work we can do at conferences with teachers and so on. And some people's work, and, and someone like, and I really like his, his provocative nature, like Will Richardson, if you've followed Will, is very provocative, asks great questions. Uh, but I think Will's focus tends to be on the schools we wish we had. So he, he tends to be great at challenging the existing paradigm and what's wrong with it and how we need to change it. On the other hand, lots of days when I go into work with teachers in schools, uh, we're working within an existing paradigm, and I don't get to change it right now. I've got a curriculum to work with. I may have in some provinces standardized assessments, uh, various policies. and so I think there are two, you know, on the one hand, if we focus on the schools we wish we had, uh, it, it starts from the presumption that, that we can't get to inspired learning um, within the existing educational framework, and we need to tear it down and rebuild it. I want to tonight kind of focus on this other view, focusing on schools, you can see I put here, schools we wish to create with what we have. This is, this is the paradigm I'm living within right now. How can I, to the best of my ability, inspire kids working within the curriculum I've been handed. Um, interesting point, growth or fixed mindset, that I can, if I have a growth mindset, I can play with the curriculum I have and the, and the parameters that I have, and I still think I can inspire kids. So I want to work with the presumption that we can create inspired learning communities within the existing structures that we have, and we can do it through renovations to our practice. And notice what I'm trying to do here is, this is what's within my control. What can I do as a teacher? I I can't go rewrite the assessment policy. I don't have the authority to change the curriculum. But I think there are powerful things we can do in our class to create the schools we want within the context that we have. So that's that's where I'm coming from. Yes. Um, interesting. For the teachers or students or both? Uh, I think uh, tonight I want to focus on what we might do, but I think it is to change a student mindset to to get them to see that learning is not about having correct answers, but it's it's challenging, it's wondering, and it's developing sound answers. Uh, by the way, the flip side of, of having students not seek for sound answers does not mean any answer goes. And this is why we have to come back to it, but is it reasonable, is it sound? Uh, I wanted us just to think about, again, uh, just as we dig into the more concrete, does the origin origins of the inquiry matter? And I think I've been touching on this, uh, so I won't spend too long here. Uh, but you know, if it has to be initiated by the students, then tonight's talk is redundant, and we can wrap up early. Uh, but if we presume that students um, can be inspired to learn in areas that they're familiar, or, sorry, unfamiliar with, then I think we have some things to talk about. So let me start you off with some, some examples. And then I'd love if you could uh, add some of your examples. 
I'm going to share with you um, many years ago when I was beginning university and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to study. I took a course uh, in ancient Greek art and architecture. And uh, Jerry Shouse was my professor at Wilfrid Laurier. And Jerry uh, would come in with slides and uh, much like this. And I will never forget his class. And it became for me, you know, one of the things on my bucket list in my young life was to get to Knossos on the island of Crete. Uh, we got there three or four years ago. Um, I, well, I'm telling you this story because before I took Jerry's class, I didn't know what Knossos was. I knew little about the Minoans. You'll probably read about them in a myth here and there. But certainly not to drive me, to inspire me to want to visit Knossos. Uh, there are times in which teachers in my life have had that kind of impact where I didn't know anything about that author. I didn't know about that historical event. I'm fascinated by it now. I, my inspiration has come from a teacher who had passion, who showed me interest, and then set me to explore. But they were the source of my inspiration. I want to show you a few other examples of this. And while I'm doing it, I think if we could, if we could share, do you have a moment in your life that stands out for you, where a teacher inspired you to want to learn more about, to question, to wonder, to to experience, like, and and you know, just if we were to share those as I, as I share another piece, uh, this uh, I, I thought was interesting from the professor and columnist, uh, you can see Steve Strogatz, who wrote a book called The Joy of X, a rather playful title. Uh, but notice what he's saying is that too often, and this is certainly in American, but I think not sure so far from Canada, that middle and high school math curriculum doesn't appeal to the heart. Instead, they, they ask kids to answer questions that they, they're not interested. They would never ask the very definition of boredom. You know, so can we use, for example, math to create that awe and wonder? What does that look like in that context? Here's something I want you to think about as a way just to get kids to do this on wonder. It might sound like an odd fit, but I've been playing with this lately to give, giving kids a baloney meter and just getting to think about as you read, as you watch and you know, look at an ad that's been showing on TV, do you think that ad has no baloney that's straight up, that's, that's solid science behind that or whatever it might be? And there's a little baloney, some baloney, a lot of baloney, or is that full of baloney? Um, I've put here, and, and I think that's the, yeah, uh, Collins, but the, the Michael Shermer has a wonderful, you know, uh, nine or ten things uh, on baloney detection in science. It's a very good science connection. But I just like this idea of giving kids a baloney detector. Let me give you an example. Um, grade five kids starting to look at First Nations and early contact. See, I would use something like Pocahontas, and I'd use the baloney meter. We're going to watch a clip from Pocahontas, and your job is to decide if Disney's portrayal of indigenous people has no baloney. It's, it's very accurate. It's a little baloney, some baloney, a lot of baloney. Oh, man, that's full of baloney. And kids now begin to explore and come back. And I think this would excite kids to, to be able to challenge your question. You know, does this source that you're reading, is it full of baloney? Let me show you. This is my, uh, my more high school version of the same thing. My, it's called my crack detector. And, and I think kids, uh, one of the ways I want to get kids, you know, just to pay attention is just say, guys, is your crap detector in place? When you listen to a claim being made, you watch a movie, you listen to Donald Trump speaking, whatever it might be, is your crap detector in place? By the way, you might listen and go, that rings true to me, and all, that's, that fits with what I understand. Uh, or maybe that seems reasonable. There's a couple of things I'm wondering about. Maybe it's lacking in some areas. You know, it's, that's not, it's not bad, but there's some areas I think are a bit problematic. There are some red flags going off for me here. This smells kind of funky. This smells of total crap to me. Imagine just giving kids this, showing them an ad in science, in media literacy, in history. Here's a document. Set your, your crap detector uh, where you think this document is on first read. Okay, let's go explore the science a little deeper. Let's go explore a bit more around this issue in psychology and philosophy, whatever it might be. And uh, yeah, I have some good good point, Colin. Colin uh, Carl Sagan has some great stuff on this. Imagine how kids got to reset that dial. So our crap detector, you know, we thought it was you know in the light green, but we began to dig a little deeper. And next thing you know, I'm swinging this over into the red. There's some red flags emerging. I think this is a playful way 
that we can get kids to, to pay attention to what's in the news, what claims are being made. Um, yeah, just to, and I think this can get that on wonder, like, how would I find that out? How would I check that out? That, 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 I wonder if that's true. I mean, I just think this is a way that, and, and again, by the way, I want you to, um, you know, I created the baloney detector for the younger grades. I'm not sure I, I want young kids going home, you know, in grade four and saying to the parents, you know, you know man, we played with the crap detector today. Um, probably not the best primary. Uh, the baloney detector struck me as a, a little more suitable for young grades, but the crap detector is not bad for high school. Uh, I do wonder, I, had, I, I wondered, some, and someone did raise this, do kids know what baloney is these days? And I, I don't. I don't know. They may. They may not. I don't know if anyone has a better term. Like I'm thinking, if you're coming from an Italian household, it might be a mortadella um, meter. Um, doesn't quite have the same ring. Um, but I think we can, you know, get them thinking about it. In fact, in fact, someone today, you know, we were thinking and talking a little bit about this. That the whole idea of bologna, you know, where does it come from? Well, it's because bologna is made of who knows what. Everything someone said from the lips to the butt of a pig. It's what spews out of both ends, uh, and so baloney kind of takes on that concept. So anyway, interesting little background. <laughs> I love the grade twos and their weekend stories out of the funky range. That's great. So I want to shift a little bit, and uh, I was thinking about as I was preparing for tonight, what are sources of inspiration that we can tap into? And I came up with nine. I don't know that my list is complete, so if you have others, please add them. I'll touch on a few of these. Um, I think one of the areas that, that can act as a source of inspiration, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, I agree, I think the, the, the vegan, do we, what would be the, is there an equivalent that, that we can add where we just throw everything, even if it's not healthy? Anyway, you have to come up with an alternative. I think need is an interesting source of inspiration that, that often, um, we want to learn something because I need to solve something. And, and, and you, you might be wondering, what's that got to do with Panama air conditioners? Um, so I, I'm, I'm making notes to myself so I can remember tonight. Um, we own a, a house in Panama on the ocean. And um, when we built the house two years ago, I don't think we had anticipated uh, the challenges that owning a home on a salt, on a body of salt water, and we have a, it's a beautiful constant breeze that blows in our backyard, and that beautiful breeze carries, um, you know, microscopic bits of salt um, that get on everything, and over time corrode any metal that's exposed. And as a result, we've had to replace so far two of our five air conditioners in the house, and I'm sure the others are going because the salt is getting onto the metal parts of our air conditioners. And that has created a need for me to try to figure out how do we protect our air conditioners. And I'm just going to give you a very quick summary of this. But as I've been exploring it, my son, who's a mechanic, said, well, you know, there is a company called SimTech who have developed this device that you put on uh, vehicles now, and you anchor it with a paddle much like a defibrillator, a small version, and it sends a negatively charged a negative charge into the metal, which prevents the salt from sticking. And they're now putting these on cars over the last dozen years or so. Instead of undercoating your car, you can put this device on, and the salt won't stick. And then the, I'm now in the process of finding out, oh, could I buy those and attach them to my air conditioner, putting a negative charge through my air conditioner to then stop it. I don't know yet, but my source of inspiration has been my need to solve this dilemma. I think if we can find those authentic, meaningful challenges for kids where they have a need, something to solve, they'll start to explore because they want to come up with the best solution. Um, curiosity, I just wonder about presenting kids with interesting dilemmas for them to come, just nurturing that I wonder piece. I think sometimes just the search for beauty. Uh, Fibonacci theorem strikes me as, you know, fascinating math to look at and it's all around us in nature or trying to understand why is the water in Lake Louise the color it is or trying to wonder um, you know how come you know uh, this morning we had a beautiful sunrise uh, why was that sunrise like that like getting kids to look at the beauty around them and wonder so we get the curiosity blending with with the search for beauty um, 
mysteries and puzzles. If any of you have been to a puzzle room where you have to try to figure a way out, it's interesting that people will pay a fair amount of money to be locked in a room so they have to figure their way out. It just speaks to our brain's love of solving puzzles and mysteries and that wonderment that comes from it. Uh, can I frame learning in history and science and various subjects around a puzzle? Uh, picking up on the brain, the brain is by nature uh, seeks a, you know sense making and pattern seeking. In math, getting kids to not just memorize a formula but try to understand, you know, why is it when you multiply a negative by a negative um, you get a positive. Can you figure that out? So that's a mystery and puzzles, brain ticklers love it, um, and pattern seeking. What do you notice in history that whenever there's an arms race, what happens to, or, you know, when you look at how humans react given these conditions, the brain loves to seek patterns and make sense. Um, just a sense of adventure, just wanting to adventure. Personal gain, I, I want to study this because I want to learn how to do something because I'd like to earn a living. Being challenged, and, and I asked my daughter, our, our daughter's studying right now for a neuroscience exam on Friday, but I interrupt her and said, I'm working on this. Can I ask you, like, what has inspired you in your learning? She will turn 20 in a few weeks. And I asked her about some trips that we've been on, for example, and she said, she said, you know, when we were in the Vatican, it was just that sense of, of wonder, of grandeur, of, of, you know, of the history. Uh, sometimes it's just it's just a sense of wonder and grandeur, she said, that I like. So those are uh, some sources, and I want to share some um, ways we might get there. So, okay, thanks, Ashley. I love this. So, so breakout ED, I'm going to check that out. That sounds great. Uh, I just put a couple of things here, and I'll just touch on a few given our, our time. Um, and some I've given examples of, but these are some ways I think are approaches we can use to get to inspired learning. Um, we just talked about exploring beauty. Cause-based learning is an interesting approach where we give kids a, a purpose to learning where they're making a difference in the world. So I put Kiva down there. If you're not familiar with it, check out kiva.org. Uh, Kiva is a micro-lending site, and uh, in it, Students can, can select, or a school or a class can, um, can select a person somewhere in the world who has applied for a loan that can be anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars, and they might want it to buy cloth to make uh, uh, clothing items to sell at a local market in, in the Andean Mountains. It might be someone in the Ukraine wanting to buy a seed. Uh, I saw someone, I think, in the Philippines uh, buying uh, cell phones or cell phone batteries to sell at a store. Uh, so they're looking for a small loan to help get them started. And you can loan in increments of $25. So you don't have to advance the whole loan. Now imagine if we said to kids in grade two who are learning about cultures or communities around the world, we're going to see who we think uh, we would like to support. And we're going to learn about where they live. And then in our, in our visual arts class, we're going to create things that we can sell, trinkets and so on, that in the school for 25 cents to raise money to loan. By the way, note in Kiva, it is a loan. It will come back. 98.7% of loans are repaid. So kids can, um, kids can select, get that money back, put it back out again, uh, creates really authentic opportunities for kids, uh, and they're making a difference in the world. We can do this around issues uh, related to the environment, to our local communities, but giving kids a worthwhile cause and doing the learning through a cause-based approach. I, I mentioned earlier Pocahontas, just getting kids to question the veracity or the, uh, the accuracy of pop culture, using this launch. Uh, Gamification of learning, uh, I don't necessarily mean, but it's not a bad part, um, getting kids to use video games to explore, but also just picking up the principles of gaming where you launch with the provocation and kids get to reset and reboot and try and so on. And the other is, is um, yeah, sorry, I'm just pausing there looking at Sandra's comments. Uh, Kiva is definitely a crowdfunding approach for um, uh, for a micro-lending support of, of people around the world. Um, charity, knowledge, and beauty. This is where I just you know, want kids to think about. I think those of you who teach grade 11, ancient history, grade 4, social studies, 
the truth is sometimes there are things in history that are just cool and kids like studying mummies because they're mummies. And, you know, I, you know, how do I get that as a source of inspiration? Inviting kids to create a museum exhibit of the greatest innovations in human history, to create an exhibit to invite your friends to of the, the weird and wonderful of the past, you know, those kind of things. But getting kids to create collections of great works of art and curate an, an art exhibit of indigenous paintings, you know, those kind of things where kids become the curators, they have to select what to showcase and why. I think we can get them excited and inspired by giving them the challenge. So I want to get into tonight, uh, so the more concrete piece, uh, what, what I think are four principles of inspired learning. Uh, I've been touching on them now. One is purpose-driven. Um, so the, the kids see a meaningful challenge, that they're not writing a report because they've been told to write a report. They see value in what they're doing. They personally see value, in, uh, and that increases interest. That I, I think a second principle is that it should engage students' emotions. It should touch the heart. How do we get kids to see value, interest, humor, um, how do we how do we engage the emotion? How do we engage voice and choice? And and here you notice I'm saying not necessarily initiated by voice and choice, but the initiation of the inquiry and the provocation may be our curriculum, and we found a way to frame it. But the lines or the way we might explore it, there's student voice and choices that communal learning someone mentioned earlier. There's this opportunity for kids to to begin to wonder once we've initiated the provocation. Not that voice and choice couldn't at times, but I don't think it's the only way. But student voice and choice is present in the, in the processing of the information. And lastly, we should be allowing for iterative responses to provocative questions. Letting kids float out an idea, try something out, um, try it again, revisit it, so they start to see that in an inspired learning environment, it's okay to test answers and retest and, and to take chances. So what I've tried to do, just uh, for, for very practical purposes, is for each of the principles uh, to try to provide some routine practices that would get at the principle, and then I'll try to give you a couple of concrete suggestions. And again, I invite you to jump in and, and ask questions, um, offer your own examples, um, add to mind. So three things I think that's practice uh, to get at the principle of purpose-driven learning. Try to identify an authentic purpose or audience. Uh, I'll go through the first two um, and encourage authentic product or performance. A lot of authentic learning has tended to be driven by the product or performance. Uh, and, and some of this I've shared with some of you will have been in a session earlier. But what, the product or performance is helpful to get kids to think about but also, if we want it to really resonate, who's seeing this work? Who's benefiting from this work? Who gets to enjoy this work? Rather than whatever projects kids create be are brought in and marked by the teacher, can we find authentic purpose and audience? So Kiva does that, for example. I think we've got a question there, so I'm going to pause that. Great. Email message coming in to me, not a question. Um, and lastly, can we use authentic examples to initiate the inquiry? So uh, some of you will have seen this. I want to share it if you haven't. Um, th this is a, a, a diagram I've been working with lately around degrees of authenticity. And I, I call this moving learning from fake fake to real real. So on the bottom, we move from – sorry, I'm just reading um, authentic purpose uh, – since they're less inspired than they were with fiction-based French learning. That's really interesting to see. I'm wondering if that authentic purpose were set in a gaming environment, if it would help. Uh, if, if what kids are simply seeing is instead of fiction, I now have a non-fiction. Like, do they see it as authentic? Or do they see it as simply non-fiction? It's an interesting, interesting dilemma you face. Now, I, I'll just show you here from my bottom, my x-axis from fake to real, is what's the nature of the product or performance we're giving kids? So, you know, a test, I would say, is fake, but um, having students design the science experiment could be real. I, I have an example up there um, that I worked with a grade 5 math class in, in Maryland, and the student's challenge was to do for cereal what Toblerone did 
for chocolate by designing a new shape for a cereal box that would uh, catch people's attention. The, the teacher started by showing kids, um, the, uh, she videotaped the, grocery, the cereal box, the cereal aisle in a grocery store and had kids look at all the cereal boxes and they all quickly noticed they're all rectangular prisms. And she said, so your challenge is to create a new shape for a cereal box that will have your cereal stand out. But it has to be easy to ship. It has to pour easily. It has to stack well on my shelf when I get it home. So the kids had some criteria that put limits on their shape, and they began to explore. I thought it was a lovely task to get kids engaged with the math. Now, I've left this in the fake real quadrant because although the task was real, the audience was still the teacher. When the boxes were done, kids invested all the time. They were brought in, marked, sent home. And so what I want to do is play with what if we sent them out to a company? What if we brought members of the um, general public in and had a bit of a competition? Are there ways that we can give that a more authentic audience? I'm wondering in this French context, for example, uh, if, if, if there's not just an authentic purpose, but there's an authentic audience. Now, uh, this is an interesting one because in French, I might be nervous and worried about messing up in public, which is why I wonder about a gaming uh, a gaming approach in which you're immersed in a video game in authentic context, but in the safety of the game to make mistakes. Anyway, this I've been just playing with in terms of are there ways we can take interesting tasks that we have and, and give them an authentic output, uh, by, right, by that I mean product or performance, but also think about who the audience might be. So, next principle, connecting on an emotional level. How do we frame a challenge that exists within the zone of proximal development, as Vygotsky called it, that, that uh, if it's going to connect the kids, they have to believe they can be successful at this. Uh, that we want to begin always with engaging provocations and give kids that rich question to start them, not don't, don't save it up, let them weigh in. I'll show you an example in a moment. Uh, when necessary, give options for consideration. So uh, some kids will struggle. We, we give them a, a question or a prov provocation to deal with, but it's like a blank sheet. And if they have nothing to fill in on that blank sheet, they can start to shut down on us. So can we uh, provide kids, well, here are three options we could consider. Which do you think might be the best option? And they begin to explore that. I saw a, science, uh, a scientist who said, you know, we should – Kids should be, have to generate two or more hypotheses and then decide which hypothesis best, is, uh, best meets the, the evidence that we've gathered. Uh, and that way that the kids are weighing options as opposed to feeling stuck. Uh, we've talked about using pop culture. We're going to touch on that in a moment. Uh, connecting to kids' lived experience or creating the experience. Sometimes we often talk about connecting to kids' lived experience. But sometimes I, you know, we have kids in our classrooms who just haven't experienced these things. In that case, we need to find a way to create the experience, whether it's the field trip, uh, whether it's um, a video clip, uh, a game. And somehow we, we create the experience so they can tap into it. And then frame it from the learner's perspective. Let me show you. Um, this is grade 10. I've tried to cut across um, examples. Colin, this is where do I launch it from my, my screen here? And can I advance it? What is it you're trying to launch here? This is the uh, education for deaf. Um, okay. Or are well, you going to send this out to the YouTube club? I will so, leave it. It, it, okay, so it's the education for deaf one. Yeah, what I'll do is is uh, I'll put it. Um, now, do you want it's uh, how long is it? It's ten minutes. Do you want people to watch the whole thing, or what? What are we thinking? With no, I, I just want them to watch about it's about five minutes. So there'll be a section where the the boy that's the feature of this um, is in school, and it's the end of the school clip. So what I want people to look at is just tapping into some some emotions at a grade ten level and how we might make use of this video. So so you're going to set it up. Yeah. So I've got to okay, set it up. Watch Five minutes, and then we'll come back together. Okay, so we'll watch five minutes. Everybody, it should play right in the, in your window here. Uh, for those people on other devices, I'll put it in the uh, chat room as well, and we'll watch about five minutes of it, and then uh, we'll sort of interrupt and then bring people back. Does that sound okay? All right, here we go.
All right, we're going to stop it there then. All okay. right, we're back. So, uh, you see, I just started to post, this is something um, I, I'm going to try to bounce around in, in grade subjects, that I might use in a grade 10 class to look at the issue of propaganda, which, uh, you know, is part of the curriculum. And I think students have a sense that propaganda is a, you know, is, is, is a bad thing. And I want them to think about them. This is a piece of Disney propaganda put out in 1943. The war is not going well. Um, it, it uses all the classic uh, elements of propaganda, you know, um, make negative impact, you know, negative uh, stereotypes of the German people, uh, you know, all kinds of pieces. Uh, and yet, you know, what's Disney's motivation is to try to get the Americans into the war. I think, in fact, this came out just before they, they got into the war. Getting kids to watch something like this, and, you know, was it effective or ineffective? What worked, what didn't work? Can propaganda be justified? Should governments use it? In what cases? What what should guide it? I think this is a way I could launch, you know, just, you know, in, and I saw some of you post it was interesting. I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts. Does, uh, do you think uh, with that at a high school level, get kids uh, wonder, inspire on wonder, about uh, events in World War II. So I, our time is short, so I'm going to keep moving, but please post um, thoughts if you could um, as, as we move on. I, I want to show you another. I'm, I'm moving around, as I said, and this is a short clip. We're going to just watch a little bit of this, um, and maybe we can... Uh, well, let me just think. Well, I want to speed ahead. This is called Math Magic Land, and I want you to take a look at how we um, get get kids thinking about... Um, math and the arts, and you know, could the arts exist without math? And so it might be a way to inspire. So here's a little bit of Math Magic Land. We'll just go up to the end of the Greek, the ancient Greek part, if that's okay, Colin. Okay, that was my question. So we'll go up to the end of the ancient Greek part, and if I miss it, then you can, uh, you can let us know to stop it. So just let me do that, and we should play it in here, and I'll put it in the chat room uh, as well. Here we go. All right, we'll pause it there then. The links, the links for all of these videos will be in the resource page for tomorrow if you want to go back and watch them all, everybody. So no worries, you can find it again. Great, thanks, Colin. So again, I'm just looking at you know, in pop culture, a clip from a movie, a clip from something like this, be a source of inspiration to, to start kids wondering, uh, you know, can where else can we find math? How can math be uh, found in in art and music and every other area. So just a, a thought there. And, and one other um, uh, principle that we want to explore, um, in voice, in, in engaging student voice and choice. Um, and the principles here, like how do we go about doing that? Uh, the first thing I'm suggesting is launch with an invitation. Let's have a launch where we invite kids to, to wonder, to offer a prediction, to offer a conjecture, to offer a speculation, to begin drafting a, a, a ideas for a model for whatever it might be. Um, provide or guide students in, in developing what I would call lines of inquiry that would help them unpack the richer question in a more kind of very tangible and a manageable way for kids. One of the dangers of student-driven inquiry is them becoming overwhelmed. They get lost and they're not sure where to go. If we can break it down into manageable pieces, either through a uh, teacher guided or helping students with their ideas, find a way to organize the exploration. Uh, teach kids how to frame and recognize a powerful question. Um, it's important that students understand the difference between a question that simply is a research where they look things up uh, versus uh, questions that will invite exploration and judgments and decision making. And we want to encourage empathy where we get children to consider how might others have felt and that might open up doors of, of exploration. I'm going to give you an example and, and some of you will know Dan Meyer's work and who uses a lot of authentic learning to try to engage kids in math. So one of his um, examples is Dan Meyer's taco cart dilemma. And in it, I'll just explain it to you a little bit. 
um, that him and his friend Ben, as you can see, are standing on the beach in the bottom left, and they spy an app on a taco cart, and they want to, uh, they're hungry, they want to get a taco. So Ben decides he's going to head from where they're standing on the beach across the sand over to the taco cart. Whereas Dan decides he's going to go straight up to the sidewalk that you see at the top of the picture and across the sidewalk so that uh, he thinks that, that the sidewalk will be faster. And I want to show you, and I'm going to show you a couple of things. Uh, one is to pick up on my principle, another way. Uh, Dan Myers then poses the question, guess who will reach the taco cart first? So first I want to offer a caution, uh, and that's in my question, does it prompt mathematical reasoning? So, you know, if we ask kids, guess who's going to get there first, do they have to reason mathematically to respond to that? What do you think? Let me just see. Anyone want to post a thought? Does that get at mathematical reasoning? So, yes, it does say guess. So, Sandra, why did you ask that? Okay, now Maria's got a good guess. Now, technically, I want, I want to see, this is where I want to play with this. Uh, it's meant to engage mathematical reasoning, but a guess uh, doesn't actually get a, a guess is a guess. And, and you know, there is a problem asking kids for a good guess. Because a guess is you throw it in. The thing. Let me just tweak this. Because now we're starting to go, well, what do we mean by guess? So what if we use a mathematical term instead? And we invite them to offer conjecture. So mathematically, conjecture, guess doesn't really have criteria. You can't make a good or bad. You, you asked me to guess, so I made up something and I guessed. But if by that we mean conjecture, then we should be clear. And if I give kids a dashboard, I just want to show you, and I invite a conjecture. And that conjecture is, do you think, and, and this is to me the really the key piece, do you think Ben's going to get there slightly ahead or way ahead? Or do you think, when I say me, I mean Dan, is Dan going to get there slightly ahead or way ahead? So this is what I mean by trying to, to engage on wondering, because getting the wonder, okay, so think, what do you think? Where, do you, where would you put this dial? Who's going to get there and by how much? And now we ask kids, how reasonable is your conjecture? And now we get, and by the way, conjecture, I can give you criteria for a sound or a reasonable conjecture. Have I paid attention to all the evidence, and does it make sense with what you know to be mathematically true? Now let me just get someone to John in there. Tell me something you know to be mathematically true. What, what do you know to be mathematically true? Great question. So one of the things we know is that walking in sand is harder than walking on cement, so we can assume the resistance in the sand will mean he's going at a slower rate. Okay. Is there something else we know for sure? What else do we know to be mathematically true? Great. Uh, Sandra, which path is shorter? Who's, who's traveling the shortest distance? Can you prove it? And by the way, I'm asking this, I just want to say, if I said to kids, can you prove that, that one person will be traveling a shorter distance? How might they go about that? James, wonderful, you just put up something that shows that you know. But what if I knew nothing about hypotenuse? Uh, sorry, Dan goes up to the sidewalk and across. Ben goes from where they're standing on the diagonal. How could a student say, I don't know, I'll check? What could they do to check? They've heard nothing about Pythagorean theorem, they do nothing about it. Could you prove your point? Yeah, just get a, a tape, a piece of string, measure. By the way, kids have now begun to say, well, how can I prove this? And they're going to start to uncover Pythagorean theorem. Uh, kids use a ruler, and math is starting to learn the math. But by the way, notice first, have we paid attention to the evidence? Can we prove? Can we reason through? And what I've done, though, is launch, and, and to the credit of Dan Myers, I mean, he launches with an invitation to, to take a stab. And I've just set up a dashboard to let kids, and by the way, now, I said earlier, you want this to be iterative, 
So I thought Ben was going to be slightly ahead, but now that I, you know, I forgot to think about how he may be slowed down by the sand, and I factor that in. You know what? I think maybe I want to lean more towards Dan getting there, and kids get to that. Sonia, I love that. Take them outside, change it to snow if it's winter, you know, um, grass versus sidewalk. Let's test it out and so on. But then let kids say, you know what? Can I shift my dial? Sure you can, but explain your reasoning why. So we let kids weigh in, and then, okay, prove it. Show me your reasoning. Let me show you, this is a, another example. This is grade seven language arts uh, a school I was working with in Ottawa, and they were reading the book of Beatles and Angels. And they had read the chapter before, which was called The Making of a Man. And just to get kids wondering about the chapter, which is the theme tonight, inspiring on wonder, we asked kids if they could predict what lesson we're likely to learn in this chapter? Now, I should tell you, before getting to this piece, we had had students pause. They were about six chapters into this book. And we asked them at that point, using a placemat, what are the most important lessons that you've learned so far in this book? And the kids began to think about the lessons, the important lessons they've learned. And we set that up to say, okay, so what lesson do you think? By the way, they were going to be creating a poster to promote this book around the important lessons you could learn in life and edit you know, create a short list and so on. So as they got ready to read this chapter, we said, what do you think might be the important lesson that's going to be learned in this chapter called the unmaking of a man? We gave them three criteria. Make sure you use all the clues you find. They should be able to connect the clues so they make sense, and it should fit with what you know already from the book. And then we gave kids three, uh, we gave them four choices. And we said, which of these is least likely to be the lesson you're going to learn? Which one do you think all the kids picked? Yeah, the kids picked number two. I don't think that's the lesson. By the way, when we ask them why not, what's wrong, why it's not, first of all, uh, it doesn't fit with what we know so far about his life. It's not what he's done. And the clues I'm going to show you in a moment wouldn't fit. So they were left with three. And we said, okay, here are words that are going to come up in the next chapter. You've got three more possible uh, lessons to be learned. What would these words suggest? Now, before we get into that, the kids were asked, are there any words here you're unfamiliar with so that we can uh, make sure that you understand what you're reading? The one where the picture is behind it, it says advanced dresser. And I, I, when I read the chapter to get ready for the lesson, I thought it meant a snappy dresser, you know, well-dressed. It turns out, and I had to back up and reread the first few pages, that the, the, grand, the father in the story, uh, when he left Africa, sorry, I should have mentioned this, someone who's left for Africa and moved to, to America, he had been um, a healer and was considered a very good dresser of wounds, and so he was an advanced dresser. I didn't know that. I, the story didn't make sense until I understood it. Kids were unsure what glaucoma was. We showed them a picture of what someone with glaucoma, what their eyesight was like. They might not have known what toil meant and so on. So we talked about some words, but then we started getting to think about, in the chapter you're about to read, why do you think there are words like respect, hero, generosity, along with ashamed, deteriorate, um, mutiny, embarrassed. What, what do you think is going on here? And so kids began to wonder about what's going on. And I see Lori is saying, well, I think number three is making sense. So now the kids begin to put these connections together. They begin to wonder. And we said, okay, let's read the chapter and see what you find out. So this was an attempt to inspire on wonder to get kids saying, huh, this is a puzzle now for me to solve. I want to read the chapter. And we found that we had raised their interest and engagement. And by the way, the other piece is when they got into the chapter, when they encountered these words that would have otherwise been a barrier to their reading, they were now familiar with the words the story made sense, and they were able to confirm or shift their answer. Uh, and, and lastly, I want to suggest that a principle we want to adhere to is launching from, uh, I'm using two ideas here, a big idea, a central idea, or a transcendent concept, by which I mean, how do we find, like, what's the idea uh, that I might be learning about in, in language arts and social studies 
that's bigger than the particular event. That, that, you know, the power of a novel is that it connects to the human experience, which is bigger than the particular event. Or, you know, if I'm looking at a, in the social studies, you know, what does this event tell us about human's capacity to innovate or human's capacity for um, being, for cruelty and so on. So, so my first practice is to try to always find the issue behind the topic. What's the relevance? What, how do I connect? What, how does this get me thinking about human nature? Uh, the environment, the world in general. Invite a reason judgment that does not presume the answer. Be careful that we don't frame questions that direct kids what to believe, but launch with an invitation for them to, to be able to do that wondering. I've talked about allowing iterative responses. Allow, not be to loop back. I think it's so important. And I've put here that we encourage affirmation, revision, or extension as your learning grows. So allow kids to think about and then invite them, does your new learning challenge that? Would you change what you, what you thought before? Does it change your answer? And make sure that kids are, are pursuing sound answers, not correct answers. You see my E is you know, Golden Hills grade six. I just wanted to quickly tell you, it, it, as we get towards the end here, uh, a year ago I worked with a grade six group in Golden Hills, the school division in Alberta, just east of Calgary, and we selected grade six social studies uh, because it was the, the course that the teachers told me the, the kids were least engaged in. Uh, they had low marks on the provincial exams, and teachers didn't like teaching. And it was easy, didn't like teaching that subject. And it was essentially our grade five. It's their civics, their government, and so on. And we launched with and getting kids to think about um, how they could build the best democracy possible, how you build your utopia and began to explore what can we learn from ancient Athens, what can we learn from the Iroquois and, and indigenous cultures, uh, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, and the kids just because they were allowed to affirm or revise their answers, and make mistakes and debate it out, they, by March I had teachers telling me their kids wanted to stay in at recess so they could continue to debate democracy, which was just lovely to hear. And the other thing at the end that we found um, the next fall that their, their provincial test scores on this exam where they had been struggling had gone up between 12 and 37 percent in the schools that participated. So we had huge gains, which makes sense because the dramatic increase in engagement as we inspired on wonder led kids to remember uh, better. I want to show you just a couple, maybe 30 seconds of this clip and I'll, I'll give you, uh, let me, let's launch the video and then I'll come okay. back and tell you how it's been used. This is at a high school level. All right, so we won't introduce it. We'll just play it. And I'll do the same thing. So just, you want to say 30 seconds or so of this? Uh-oh. Oh, dear. I appear to have frozen. Oh no. Oh hell no. So let me just, I, I noticed that Colin seemed to get bumped out, and did, did you see the video, or were some of you having trouble seeing that? Okay, some saw it. Um, okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I, I just got booted out, too. It kind of crashed on me. I apologize about that. Yeah, so, so most saw it, some didn't. So let's, we'll make sure we post the link. Now let me ask you, yeah, you who did see it. Um, any any reactions to it?
Okay, uh, I, I'm, Jay, I'm glad to see, that. that's what I thought, I think cool or what, uh, it's really interesting. Um, and I'm showing you this for this reason. First of all, um, my daughter was shown that in her first year biology class at the University of Toronto. And she said, I, she came home, she said, I was just enthralled. I just sat there watching that. I just thought it was amazing. So I love that. There's the awe and wonder. But it's what the professor did with it that I find really interesting. She showed kids this, and she said, if you understand my course, by the end, you will be able to find 16 different cellular processes in that video. She paused a couple of times throughout the course and asked kids, now how many can you find? And the very last class, they watched it one last time and said, okay, can you find the 16? My daughter used this routinely to say, as she would re, you know, review her lectures and so on, she'd watch the video, and she'd have these aha moments. Oh, there's another one. I just love the way this video, first of all, it's just stunning to watch, and then someone said the music really works with that and so on. But notice the challenge the teacher gave, the puzzle that really hooked the kids in. So can you find 16 cellular processes? By the way, the first day, that's a diagnostic. How many can you find now? Coming out of high school biology, can you find two? So how many can you find? Okay, I see where we're starting. Four classes in, how many can you find? Eight classes in, okay, the end. Like what a lovely way not just to take a stunning video, but to set it up as an iterative process where kids can test and, by the way, self-regulate. So I want to show you that and just think of are there places where we have similar opportunities to show kids something, grab their attention, get that on wonder going and say, now, as we work through the course, we'll come back to this. We'll revisit it. I'll show you a really quick example. As I said, I'm bouncing around from grade to grade. This was a, a, a Jewish day school I would be working with. They were looking at uh, writing biographies of extraordinary people. And so first thing they did is they built the criteria for an extraordinary person. You can see the criteria they were using was a person who never gives up. They inspire others, they act as a role model, and they make a difference. And you will see the children uh, around the room, each table had information on different, on different people, and kids got to pick what table they wanted to start at and they would read about, and then they had a ranking ladder, and they had to pick as they went from table to table, which three people best meet the criteria, and who goes first, second, third. So you might be able to see Matt's on the right, Rick Hansen, Beethoven, and Stephen Hawking, and then the reasoning down below. The one on the left is the class consensus as kids voted. Uh, Pierre Trudeau came in on top, um, Tandy came in second, uh, and so you may wonder, who is Tandy, which is what I asked the teacher, who's Tandy? Tandy is their school security person and crossing guard. And when the kids were invited to start at a table, no, none of the kids went to the table that talked about Tandy. But as they worked their way around, kids began to say, well, hold it, she meets all the criteria. And Tandy ended up beating, bumping Moses down into third place that you can see there. So I, but notice the, again, iterative nature where kids got to begin to explore and wonder and learn about, and as they learned about, they had a ranking ladder for them to debate and discuss. By the way, to me, a highlight is when the teacher said, you know, at one point when a group was defending uh, why they thought this person um, should be on the ranking ladder and, and fairly high up, one of the little boys at the other table stood up and said, oh, that's really convincing. I'm coming over to your table. I just love the fact that they had the open-mindedness to say, you've convinced me, I want to join your table. And so kids, that's that communal, that collaborative piece. I want to finish on one last piece. Again, it's one, uh, it's something that's just had me, you know, I'm not sure I agree with this, so I'll just set this up. I read this just the other day, if it's not medium agnostic, it's not project-based learning, and then the definition here that learning that's driven by big understandings, not tasks, so students can choose however they want to demonstrate their learning. So again, it got me thinking. And I wondered, could working within a specific medium not be the big idea? How to write up an effective lab report? How to write a sound historical research paper? How to perform a dance in a specific genre? Like, do we not have times in which the medium is the big idea, and therefore it would not be up to the kids to choose whatever they want. That if I'm teaching kids um, how to perform a monologue, I would want them to perform a monologue that the medium would be the big idea. If I'm trying to teach you how to write a particular text form, I don't think I would throw it open. So could not project-based learning, or good inquiry at least, 
still have a medium that's defined by the way we want kids. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll give you another. Oh, geez, I don't know what happened there. That's supposed to be much smaller. Yeah. This one's asking, uh, is sometimes the medium the way we engage kids? So uh, a, a school I'm working with out in Alberta, uh, they're learning about, um, and grade sixes are learning about astronomy and about solar system. And their, uh, their challenge is to prepare a sky science museum exhibit of the, of the most important ways, answering the question, is space exploration worth the cost? Which I think is an interesting question. Um, so sometimes is the way we get kids to explore important things that they might not realize importance by giving them a medium. Uh, we've had kids do a philosophy cafe. Um, we've had kids uh, do collections of poetry that they're going to publish. Like are these ways? Now, I realize you're almost out of time, so I'll just quickly, you know, my other worry, if we want to get grand collaborations, then we need to help coordinate those rich tasks. So a drama production, dance production, music production, publishing student works, putting a character on trial, doing a recreation from World War I, uh, engaging in social justice projects. If we simply say to kids, You're, you can do whatever you want, you won't get to these pieces. So I think sometimes uh, I would just caution against assuming that giving kids, always giving kids choice over the outcome or the product uh, isn't always the best way. Uh, very quick, a few examples, and we'll stop. Uh, I used to put on medieval banquets with a history club. Uh, we did one to the mar marriage of Henry VIII and Lady Jane Seymour. We would do us uh, with a history club after school and on weekends. And I began to realize that the best learning I was getting my kids to do was in a history club, not in my class. So I wanted to find ways. How do I bring that into my class? How do I make how do I make throwing this big historical banquet the way they learned about a time period? Now, that did require that I did set the outcome, that the project was defined up front, and we would never have been able to pull it off if every child just said, well, I'm just going to go off and do my own. So an example of, I used to put in our high school history class Joseph Stalin on trial, greatest leader who helped defeat the Nazis or mass murderer, how should we see him? Kids would argue it out. Again, there was a central task in which kids explored and questioned and carried out the trial, but there was some structure that I created. So, last thing, because then you got to go. I was thinking about this, and this is actually a project I was just asked yesterday to frame for a school district in Delaware. This is what I've come up with so far. So if you have three minutes to give me, uh, I'd love to get your feedback. It strikes me that we could say to kids, in your action learning project is what I'm calling it, you have four areas that you can work in. You can create something of value that will help uh, serve the common, common good. You can innovate. So rather than create and innovate, you have to develop something new. You can participate in the social action project, or you can curate uh, indigenous art and so on. Kids would pick the area in which do you want to create, innovate, curate, or participate, but it has to make a difference in the world for someone, and away they go. Um, and so this was a bit of a guide that you'll, you'll get tomorrow, um, that when we create, we recreate, we curate, we write for purpose, we perform, we imagine differently. So I'm running through this quickly, but I'm thinking of this as a way that the passion project is woven into um, a social studies, language arts, science integrated approach, and kids start to look at how they want to take action in, in, in their world. But I still have some foundations to teach, so it anchors it in, in important learning of concepts, but where kids go with it uh, could vary. Uh, another one is we've had kids create their own board game. As you learn in the course, you'll write the questions and the activities that your game, but they will reflect the course content. So I'm still teaching content. You'll invent the board game and that, that would have kids use that. Or kids publishing your own work. So I'm just going to stop here. My apologies. I, I want, I'm rushing through a little bit because we've gone over a little bit. But I think the key to me in inspired learning for kids is where it becomes, and people said this earlier, so you've got your way ahead of me, that we want to make learning this collaborative journey of innovation and exploration, collaborative between kids, between teacher and kids, not in an exercise in compliance and application, um, but rather a collaborative journey of, of innovation and exploration. Um, and Deb, I think we will have that linked. I'll just get Colin to confirm that, but we'll make sure we get that. 
I'm going to stop there because I've gone over. I, I hope there were bits and pieces. As I said, it's the first time I've done this piece, um, and I'm just doing lots of thinking about it. But I think we can work within our existing curriculum, within our, our existing structures, to really create um, you know, kids who are excited to be in school. Okay, I'm going to stop there, but thanks so much, everyone, for your participation and, and your tonight. Awesome. Thanks very much, Garfield. I'm sorry for the little technical glitch there on that last video. Uh, join me in, in, in offering a virtual round of applause there for Garfield. I, I uh, always learn a lot. It was very enjoyable, and I really, uh, really uh, had a good time here as well. Um, so thank you for everybody for participating. Just real, very, very quickly, uh, when you sign out of the session, you will get a pop-up to uh, a feedback survey. There's also a link here on this screen um, that you can click and do. When you're finished the uh, feedback survey, you'll get the option to go to a place where you can print a certificate to hang on to and, and keep in your portfolio, um, you know, for your self-directed PD and that kind of thing. Uh, the the uh, certificate is only uh, available for 48 hours apparently, so you have to do that kind of right away. Um, so that will pop up there. Uh, just real quick, we've got a bunch more sessions, and as most of you are, are return visitors to OTF, um, you'll know that there's always more stuff coming up. So just please take a look at the OTF website and some of the things that are coming up very shortly. And last but not least, if you're looking to take an AQ, uh, OTF has some money available for you to do that. So I'm going to stop the recording here, and once more, just thank uh, Garfield for a really cool session and, and uh, inspiring us to, to get kids, you know, thinking and, and uh, thinking about how awe and wonder can really drive the learning in our classroom for our kids. So thanks a lot, Garfield, and thanks everybody for joining us this evening.